Nigeria has 70.8 million hectares of agriculture land with maize, cassava, yam, beans, millet and rice as the major produce. Aquaculture may not be as mainstream as this cross-listed. That's because fish farming is a different kettle of fish. Anyone delving into this business must understand the intricate details and that is why we are here at one of the largest fish farms on the continent to understand the trading and the administrative structure. Welcome to Community Reports. I am Dari Ito. Nigeria imports about 2.4 million metric tons of frozen fish annually. The Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development said Nigeria's annual fish demand was 3.6 million metric tons, but only 1.2 metric tons is produced locally. There are deficits and these deficits are being supplemented with frozen fish importation. On the flip side, Nigeria is the largest producer of African catfish, and that's where this farm comes in. Catfish is their mainstay. The area where fish farm village it's a product of academic research conceived to fight poverty at the community level. It is an idea that has boomed. The farm now sits on 156 hectares of farmland with 1,300 smallholder farmers managing roughly 4,000 ponds. The land is a lease from the Ogo state government, but day-to-day -day activities of the farm is overseen by an administrative setup domiciled at the King's Palace in Ijebudi. Uh, the area where Fish Farm Village um, was established by Ijebu Development Initiative on Poverty Reduction in 2002. Uh, the Ijebu Development Initiative is traditionally owned by Awujale of Ijebuland. And, um, and that is why our office is here, headquarters office is here. Late Professor Akima Bogunje uh, came up with an idea of using city consultation to fight poverty. So he came to Awujale um, to tell him about his idea. And Awujale approved that idea. And in year 20, 1999, March 21st to 24th, 1999, uh, people met here, over 400 people, representatives of various stakeholders, the, the traditional rulers, the quarter heads, the cooperative people, the local government, the people in academy, uh, students, market women and so on like that, artisans, chamber of commerce, they met for almost four, for 400, over 400 people met here in the palace and they discussed for three good days on what and what can be done to fight poverty. All these, they are our discussions. We turned that to what we call action plan. And in that action plan, they were the people that said, if there is a cluster cooperative farm village, it will help in the promotion of agriculture in the Jebuland. That is how we came about. So by, and that started in 1990. So by 2002, we got the approval of the state government to give us the first 50 hectares at Tedewe. Later, later, it turned to be 156 hectares of farmland at Tedewe Farm Village. The Tedewe program started as a, a solution to addressing community poverty in Ijebude. It later expanded to Ijebu land and uh, the community 
anyway, there are a lot of efforts at uh, identifying how extensive is the poverty and uh, what and what could be done. A board was set up of volunteers uh, by our KBC, the Awujale of Ijebuland, and uh, the board was oversight with the functions of uh, developing programs and projects that could address poverty of its people. And that is the evolution of uh, And uh, in doing that, there has been a lot of, there, we didn't have anywhere to copy from. We didn't have anybody to learn from. So there was uh, evolution, trial and error, successes and failures. We were able to identify our successes and we were able to multiply those successes. And that's uh, what we have today. The firm is structured and run on a communal setup, primarily developed to impart lives. We have cooperative societies, uh, cooperative committees that are in charge of um, seeing the affairs of cooperative system there. And over there, we have each, we don't give, we don't recognize each, I mean, individuals, but we recognize cooperative society, minimum of 10, maximum of 20. And the cooperative too, they have their own organogram, uh, headed by the president, secretary and all that, the, the, over there. So they run the affairs. But on the top of the cooperative society, we have union. At the area of our village, yes, we have two unions there. One is um, in charge of aquaculture, the other one is in charge of uh, livestock. So two different unions there uh, um, um, that are saddled with their own um, um, responsibility of overseeing whatever they are doing. Now, yes, the entry points into our programs is training. Anybody that comes that is a member, a stakeholder in this thing came in through training. You come in, whatever you, if you have a particular interest, you are going to be going to fish farming, you come in into training, we do a two, three days training. From training, you are formed into a cooperative society. And from the cooperative society now, we are allocated land, we are giving support. You will now learn from both your cooperative members and the existing farmers on the land. So it's a type of farming we call cohort farming. We put everybody together so that we can share the risk and share the resources. It makes it easy for our members to get along. If you have a challenge, somebody else has had that type of challenge before, you can learn from me. There are resources that are shared. So, and those resources now make, improve your profitability. Security, if you have a separate farm, you have to provide your own security, which is going to be a spam. But if you are in their farm, you contribute to a peanut to the security and we provide the last security to everybody. So it will improve your profitability and that is uh, one of the key to the success of that project. It's a typical of an Indian We go into the world, we make our impacts and we sell also traditional for us to come back to our community to see what can I do to contribute to the to my society and make it a better place. So the directors are pro, no, pro bono, we don't take any. We also contribute money to the development of the place because it's our contribution. And uh, as for remuneration, it is done. We don't, we use our own resources and we also gather information. We use our expertise, our, con our developmental contribution to our community and uh, we are happy that uh, we are getting results. So we do periodic review to look at our impacts, where, which areas we can also go into. It's a continuous development. And uh, among us, we have professionals, we have professors, we have university lecturers, we have researchers. We, most of our, body, uh, our projects are research-based. We just don't jump into uh, this thing we do uh, just like the initial project was from, as a result of a research. There is a community research to determine the extent of poverty, uh, what is, was causing the poverty and what solution can be applied. The, uh, the project, uh, the initiative came up. Also, we also require that each time we go back, when we are going to do a youth, we are still going to start our youth projects, we also do a, a lot of uh, research to find out who and who among the youth are 
really in poverty? What and what can we do? What are the areas of impact that will make specific impact? And that has been, uh, we are research-based and uh, development organization. Blessing Akiye is our guide into the farm. He knows every corner, every pond, like the back of his hands. <laughs> yes, uh, the farm village is seated on 156 hectares of farmland. Uh, people are organized in cooperative groups. Uh, we have like uh, roughly 47 active cooperative groups at the moment with membership strength uh, minimum of 10, maximum of 20. So we just put them in, in that cooperative group. So uh, the cluster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they now form the major cluster. Okay, so now where we're going, is yeah. something is happening there at the moment. Yes, so yes. What is it? Uh, well, uh, somebody is selling uh, their fish uh, at the moment. So we'll just take us through uh, the process of harvesting okay. and how the fish is being packaged and, and the sales. Because eventually we're going to go into the harvesting part of things. Like, say I'm in, to, in this market, yeah. I want to learn how to. Fish. Yes, yes. So, so, what are these? Yeah, these are fish already harvested. Uh, the process is they harvest them from the pond and they put them into all of these bowls. Uh, they are sorted according to different sizes and then they get to load them up in these vehicles. A vehicle like this can contain like 20 of these. Yeah type of buses, uh, of this type of bowls. Uh, the longer buses can contain around 60, 55, 60. Okay, so let's sort Sorry. So this is one of the ponds. Yeah, we, we operate majorly earthen ponds here. Uh, these, and this is the typical how uh, most of our ponds are. We have roughly like around 4,000 of this type within the entire facility. Where there's other Okay, yeah, that, that's that's where we're going to. That's where we're going to at the moment. Yeah, I'm sure. So, press I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. That's actually the president of the Farmers Union okay. here. Oh, okay. Mr. So Cordy then, okay, part of what we're talking about is the structure. Yeah. So it's good that someone, we're meeting someone like him. Yeah. That there's a structure, there are people who coordinate things on the ground. Yeah. Well. Is that what it is? Yeah. All of the cooperative groups have a union, okay. an umbrella union. Uh, we have two unions here, the Aquaculture uh, Farmers Cooperative Union and then the Livestock. So all of the fish cooperative groups, 47 of them, happen to be under the, the union and he is the president. So the harvest process, like we said, yeah, so the harvest process, like we said, the fish are being drawn out of the water and then they are being scaled. They are being sold in kg. I mean, so they engage different sizes, different uh, prices also. And then once they do all of that, they, what they are doing there is what they call sorting. All of the fish, trying to put them into different sizes. Then thereafter, they just scale it and they They're take it out. Some back into the pond. Uh, yes, that means that there is a particular size they are looking at to sell at this harvest. So once it doesn't fall within the category of that size, they return it back to the pond. Yeah, so that's that's just the dynamics. Yeah. So the people who come around to, to like, um, are they part of the cooperative or other people who are just individual sellers can always walk in and liaise with a cooperative person and to buy? Yeah, the farm is open to people to buy. The farm is open to people to to buy as much as possible. People who are reselling, people who are the bulk suppliers, people who have um, maybe for events, people who want to eat. 
as much as possible, people can buy as low as two kilograms and people can buy as much as one ton, that is 1,000 kilograms. That land is allocated to them, they get to construct their ponds, they put in their own infrastructure as their own sort of contribution towards it and then they, they conduct their business. So they raise their fish to their preferred age, three months, four months, some might go as much as nine months, ten months, eleven months. So where do you come in? Because again, you're not going to just train them and leave them to conduct the business the way they want. So there will be that guidance, there will be that yes, um, yes. set rules and guidelines yeah. as well. So, so where, us where we come in is, uh, aside from giving them land and then um, security, there also we have extension services uh, on ground, we have extension staff who work on the farm. And then also as an organization, we try as much as possible to source for some sort of support externally, maybe it's in form of credit or loans uh, from organizations, from government, and then we administer it to, to the farmers here. So, and then also we do some bit of linkages to link them up with some opportunities as they come. One of the major uh, elements of catfish is that it is majorly sold live. Uh, so everybody wants to consume catfish, wants to be sure it's alive before they consume it and that, that has been a major issue around its marketing. So people who come to buy, they devise a means in which they keep it alive regardless of the location or how far they are taking it. And then aside from that, um, I've been preaching the gospel of value addition, be it through smoking and all of that. And very recently there are some technology that are coming up. Uh, to show us ways in which we can actually preserve catfish using the blast freezer and the cold room. But these are recent developments and that we are trying to jump on very soon. Uh, but as regards preservation of life and all of that, uh, they are, and the catfish too are quite hardy. They can survive for a longer duration in as much as they are inside water. So that's why most of the bowls you see once they sort them out, they still put in water before they are being onboarded into the vehicles that will transport so I, them. I've, I've seen a case study of uh, someone who deals with catfish and eventually when the person did so, maybe not catfish, but when he was recording a lot of wastages, he figured out that he needed to be a processing as well. Yeah. Are you looking in that direction? Um, yes, we have a processing center on the farm. Uh, it's right at the entrance where people can bring in their fish to be smoked, you know, smoked. We have a 600 kilogram uh, capacity smoking cans there, uh, wherein people can bring in their fish. So also, yeah, processing is part of the things that happens on the farm. It is a big farm, and there are many groups with a membership that keeps growing. The major objective is to sell. In the past four years, our production annually has been around 1,700 and 2,000 metric tons of catfish that has been produced consistently for the past four years and that monetary value is around a billion, a billion plus. So okay. I'm here to learn how to fish, so so this is of course a very crucial part of the harvest, so what, what's happening? Yeah, they are trying to harvest and the process of that is you'd see that the water level is down, uh, they lessen out the water so as to allow them and restrict uh, much environment for the fish. They wouldn't have much uh, of space. So, and you can see the net. Uh, they are dragging them towards a particular, towards this side, wherein they can get to, you know, bring them into all of these bowls. So, as they are dragging, fish that is within that axis would be dragged up until this point, and then they will be moved into all of these uh, containers, and thereafter they scale them and they package them for transport so they're bringing them out already you can yes. see the fish yes that's it so on the average how many of those can they bring out uh, they can bring out as much as possible because once they do that once they are done with what they have there they go again they go again and again and again till they have exhausted if they want to do the entirety of the pond till they have exhausted it so, so there are specifications as to how why the, the pond can be, do you give, do you give that? Um, well, there are no written specifications, but majority of our ponds usually are uh, 20 by 40 feet now. 20 by 40, 20 by 50, or 25 by 50. 
because typically everybody is given one plot of land. That is a typical 50 by 100 feet and it's expected that we should have two of this on it. So that's why you, the majority of the ponds you would see here will be within this, uh, this site. And I understand one thing about fishing, you have to keep this in its natural habitat. Is that why you have this color of the water? Uh, yes, because it's earthing, the earthing pond gives it a bit of um, some sort of uh, a simulation of the natural habitat. So well, most of the water here are supplied by boreholes. Uh, pumping machines, they pump them, there are exit points in the pond, in the pond and all of that. So it is through the exit points that they had to release the water before it came down to this level. Irwe, a river, though not the direct source of the water at this farm, but not unconnected to why the water table here is high. And with the free-flowing fresh water into the ponds, the fishes also seem to love it here. Took a steep walk down the riverside just to catch a glimpse of the water. Say I have a pond, yeah, <laughs> and uh, walk me through how I'm going to start having a fish in the water, and how long it will take for me to start a burst. Uh, well, uh, from start, one needs to decide uh, where the age or the quality of what one wants to produce. So the first thing is once the pond is ready, once the pond is constructed, one major thing is that one must check that uh, it's actually retaining water. One must check that it's actually retaining water. And because if it doesn't retain water, there's no way it will be great for what it's being used for. Thereafter, one will procure what we call the fish seeds. We call them fingerlings or juveniles, whichever the case may be. And they are introduced into the pond. The fish seeds are being produced at the hatchery. We have a hatchery here functioning on the farm also. So once it, they're being introduced, they start feeding them. So the size, the end size that the farmer has in mind the time is, the time, is, uh, is going to determine how long. So there are some particular sizes, you get them in three months, you get them in four months. But majorly, to achieve a table size, mostly production is around five to six months. But there are some quite big sizes that uh, farmers produce and they might take that up to seven, nine, ten months. I mean, one of the advantages of being in a farm like this yeah. is 
of course, cluster farming is you can compare notes, you can yeah, uh, see cool what is going to be resources together yeah. and all of that. So, how did this source for the finger link, aside the fact that, of course, you are one that is built in this facility? Yeah. So, can people bring in their own um, items to, uh, to feed or to take care of their own uh, home? Yeah, definitely. People can source for their items or wherever it is. Uh, you know, what we are just trying to provide is an enabling environment where there is security, where they, they have uh, assurances that there wouldn't be intrusion. So once we give them that enabling environment, then they can do their businesses, they can bring in their materials because uh, looking at it factually, we don't even have the capacity to service everybody. So as much as possible, they bring it. They have their own trusted vendors across uh, Ijebu and outside Ijebu, they, where they get in their materials, be it feed, be it fish, uh, fingerlings, be it medication and all of that. The, the buyers come from virtually across the country, uh, from as close as Lagos and Ibadan, and as far as um, Makodi, Potako, Tonicha. Because the the southeast is actually the southeast is actually a large has a large market for catfish.